All right, how's everybody doing today? Good to see you all. We're going to be getting into the book of Daniel again. Uh, we're in Daniel chapter 3 this morning. And um, if you have your Bibles, why don't you just uh, start turning there, Daniel chapter 3. Um, we're in this series, I Dare You. And uh, last week we talked about daring to believe. This week we're talking about uh, daring to stand. And uh, that, is, that is our topic for today in Daniel chapter 3. Um, a familiar story we're going to be looking at, but uh, probably some not so familiar application that I hope that we draw out from it today as we go to God's Word. So I just want to invite you, why don't we pray and ask God to just uh, teach us something this morning from His Word and apply it to our lives. So Lord, we just thank you that we have this opportunity to be in your Word today. We pray for your blessing on, uh, on our time and pray that your Spirit would just speak to us. God, through the truths of Scripture, through these words, Lord, uh, we pray that you would make them come alive. And uh, Lord, that we would recognize, Lord, that you are the all-sufficient sovereign God of the universe, and we can come to you in our times of struggle and in our times of brokenness, and Lord, we can, we can recognize that, God, you are fully in control. Lord, we uh, want to declare that today, and we pray, Lord, that we'd be a people that, uh, that declare that to our communities and to our world. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, hey, um, just, uh, just so I can get, I, I hate fakeness in church. If we could get just a quick moment of honesty from everyone. Um, who here has had in the last 14 days what you would call a really bad day? Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. This is good. This is good. Okay. Because part of my job is to help you just realize that... Um, it's not, it's not really as bad as you think it is. Um, your life is not really as mis miserable as you may tell others it is, okay? Um, and so to do that, I was, I was kind of browsing on Google this week, and that kind of is dangerous. Um, but uh, I have some things that I wanted to, to show you guys, some things that have happened this week. Um, actually, not this week, but, but around, around the world of some people that just had some bad experiences. How about this guy? You think he's having a bad day? That's like a barge with cars on it. <laughs> oh, my. How'd you like that one to happen at your funeral? Oh, my. <laughs> any, any of you teachers get that? I heard some of the Payton City teachers almost got that, okay? We feel for you. He's trying to take a shortcut. <laughs> Poor guy here. You know, eggs are getting cheap, aren't they? Go down, to, go down to Aldi's and Marietta, you can get them cheap. Whatever. Painted his car. <laughs> That'd be a bad day right there. <laughs> can you read it? Wet paint. <laughs> this guy, man, he's trying to ride on the sidewalk, but yeah. Gotta wait till it dries. Anybody ever done this one? Who's done that before? Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah, today will be a good day. Never mind. Okay. What I want you to know, I mean, this is silly and funny. I know that you guys have been going through things that are probably a lot more difficult than maybe what I just showed you. But, but to give you a little bit of perspective, the encouraging word of the day is this. It can always get worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> think about it. If you think about it, you may be like, Jonathan, seriously, that is not what I wanted to hear. I came to be built up, encouraged, and you're telling me it can always get worse. Well, yeah, it can. Okay, let's just be honest about it. And I, I don't want to put a damper on what you're going through today. I know some of you are going through a lot of difficult things. Maybe probably the most difficult thing you've ever gone through in your life. You may be coming out of a very difficult time. You may be going through a difficult time. Or you may be just starting into a difficult time that you're going through in your life or with your family. And, and often I believe the question when we're going through difficult times in our life is this, God, where are you? Where are you, God? What are you doing? You know, a lot of Christians, I believe we have this attitude of when we're a follower of Jesus, that he protects us from everything and nothing bad is ever going to happen. 
Okay, is that true? Is that true? No, okay? We shouldn't even expect it. Jesus told us this, and I have a scripture I want to give you because I want to just set up for you where we're going in Daniel 3 to give you a little bit of perspective as to where these guys were, okay? Jesus said this, John 16, 33, in this world, you will have tribulation. So expect it. But take heart. Here's the encouraging word. I have overcome the world. I don't know what it might be that's in front of you right now. Maybe it's a financial fire. Maybe it is a um, health-related fire. Maybe it's a relational situation that you're going through. Um, it, it could be your job is unstable or, or the lack thereof. Maybe you're unemployed and you're, you're trying to figure out why is this persisting? Why is my health not getting better? Why, why am I not able to land a good job? When are things going to get better? And you're asking God, what, what, what are you doing, God? Why are, you, are you there? Do you care? What do you do when you're in the middle of the fire? That's really the question that I want to ask for us today. What do we do when we're in the middle of the fire? Well, James has a word for us today. Actually, sorry, we'll get to James later. It's in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, which says this. And, and, and here, here's another word that I want you to just consider today from, from Scripture um, it's this, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. Mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So give, give a little perspective to what you're going through. Okay, you all said you've, you've had some bad days. Those bad days, those trials that you're going through, what they do is they are like a fire that reveals your faith. These trials reveal faith and will show whether your faith is genuine or not. And so here's the key point that I want you to write down. We're going to be referencing back to it a few times in, in my talk this morning. It's this, a faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. In fact, today we're going to look at a faith that was tested in the lives of three teenage boys, probably 14 and 15 years of age. Okay, some of you, some of you boys are around that age right now. That was them. They had a faith that was tested and their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've heard this story before, probably a lot in Sunday school, okay? It's, it's, you know, one of those easy, engaging stories to teach, but my goodness, it has a lot of application for us as, as followers of Jesus. So I want you, if you haven't gone there, turn to Daniel chapter 3 with me, Daniel chapter 3. If you're here last week, I introduced you to King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? Um, Kebu King Nebuchadnezzar was, was an evil dictator. He, he was incredibly wicked, um, but, but a very religious man who worshiped a lot of gods, even thought of himself as a god. And this point in chapter 3, we see that Nebuchadnezzar has raised up a giant statue and he's told the people of his kingdom, you need to bow down and worship this golden statue. It was 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. Okay, that's, that's like a mini wa uh, um, Washington monument. Who's, who's been to Washington and seen that before? That real tall thing, okay? I mean, if, if you ask me, I would say uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was trying to compensate for something, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. But, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know why he built this thing. Obviously, he had this pride issue about him, and uh, he wanted people to worship what he had set up. And so he calls every government leader, every official, every advisor, every judge, every magistrate to come to its dedication. That's where in chapter 3 we see in verses 4 through 6 that when they were to come, a herald shouted out these words. When you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, tigon, harp, bagpipe, all these kind of musical instruments here to fall down and worship the golden image that the King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. 
If you read on in verses 12 through 15, if you're, if you're there in Daniel 3, you'll see everyone is bowing low, all except for there's three teenage boys who continue to stand. And what we see is this, number one, if you're taking notes, faith obeys God instead of following man. Faith obeys God instead of following man. These men's faith was tested. Everyone is bowing. These three are standing. The scripture says that in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar commanded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before him. They're dragged into the king's court. They're questioned. They're even given a second chance. Bow down and you won't be killed, okay? But if you don't, you're going to endure death by a fiery furnace. And they replied this, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. These little teenage boys, just, just think about how cocky teenagers can be, okay? Maybe they were a little bit cocky. Maybe they said, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't care, okay? Who cares, Nebuchadnezzar? Because we don't have to answer to you. We answer to God. It's him who we're trying to please. It's not between us and you. It's between us and God. See, faith obeys God instead of following man. They didn't have to pray about it. They didn't have to think about it. They didn't have to fast about it. They didn't have to take this dramatic circumstance in their life and post it on the all-wise Facebook social media community to get their feedback. No, they didn't. They said, I'm going to be obedient to God. And they had a predetermined plan that they were going to obey God rather than follow man. They said, we will be obedient no matter what. So faith obeys God instead of following man, okay? Now, I just want you to think about it critically, okay? It would have been very easy for these boys to rationalize bowing down and worshiping something, okay? They were probably in a huge crowd, and they probably wouldn't have even been missed if they just bowed their head or they bowed, bowed low, and, and they just said, we're not worshiping it. We're just doing the act, and it's not really what we're doing, okay? They could have done that, okay? Think about it. Or, or they could have just said, you know what, um, we'll worship this idol and, and, and tomorrow we'll feel all guilty and we'll repent and we'll say, God, forgive me. They could have done that, right? A lot of us do that. Or maybe they could have had this rational thought. Well, if I, if I don't bow down, I'm dead. <laughs> and then who's going to tell people about Jehovah, the true God? Who's going to be a witness to them about him? A lot of people in history have had that thought as well. Maybe I should just compromise just this one time. But they didn't do that. No, they decided beforehand, we will honor and we will obey God and we will not follow what everyone else is doing. And I want to just tell you this, church, there are going to be times when our friends, our community is going to stand up and condemn us and say, you are crazy. Why are you taking a stand for the truth of God's word when everybody else is bowing down and caving in? Why, why are you taking a stand? And they're going to they're gonna label you as something that does not reflect who you are. They're going to think you're crazy. But we're going to say this, a faith, a true faith, a faith in the fire, what does it do? It obeys God. It obeys God rather than men. It doesn't listen to the comments of the consensus. We obey God and we obey him alone. So faith obeys God instead of following man. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted, okay? That's, that's number one, okay? Number two is this. A faith, it obeys God in spite of what it sees, Faith obeys God in spite of what it sees. Let's, uh, let's go to Daniel chapter 3, and it's in verse 17. The story continues. As, as we're reading here together, it says, um, They responded to the king. If this be so, if you're going to throw us into the fire, if that's what you say you're going to do. He said, Our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will. Deliver us out of your hand, O king. And what we get from this is that faith obeys in spite 
of what it sees. So they were looking at the flames of the fiery furnace. They were coming to grips with the reality in front of them that in all likelihood they were going to be thrown in and they were going to burn to death. But they had to remind themselves, no matter what I see, God is all-powerful to deliver me, and I believe that he will. You know, it's easy to doubt God in times when we can see things clearly in front of us. We, we, we've seen him happen before, and, and we, we know that that will be our outcome. But God is not confined to the things that we see. In Hebrews 13, verse 8, it says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same power that we see our God demonstrating here in this story is the same power that our God has today. It also says in Ephesians 3.20, I referenced it in Sunday school this morning, it says this, He is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to His power that is at work within us. Our God sees what we don't see, He controls what we don't know, and He can work in power that we don't have available to us. If this is true... Why should we doubt? Now, this statement would lead us to probably the hardest question that we would ask in this life. What if God doesn't do what you are believing in him to do? What if he does not come through? Okay, maybe you're struggling uh, physically right now and you're believing God that God is going to bring you healing. But God doesn't do it. And you keep on getting worse and worse and worse. What if you're believing, maybe you're praying for God to heal someone else and and they die? What if you're believing that God will bring your child back into the faith and they seem to be sucked farther and farther into addiction and rebellion against God? What do you do then? That's where some of us are living right now. We're living where we've been praying over and over again. God, would you heal? God, would you restore? God, would you call them back? And what I want to pass on to you is this, and you can write this down. I I think this is foundational when it comes to obedience to God. It's this, faithful obedience is our responsibility. Faithful obedience is our responsibility. The outcome is God's. Now, this is so, so key. Living out What God has called us to do, the life that he's purposed for you to live, that is your job and that's where your job ends. What God does after that is where his job begins. Now, in Daniel 3 verse 18, we remember these boys, they're staring down the king and they're saying, I believe that my God is able, I believe that my God is willing, but what do they say in verse 18? Let's look at it. Keep on going. But if not... Some of your translations say, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Even if he doesn't, we will do what is right before God. We will trust him with the outcome. Now, again, I believe it's very easy to hear those words because we know God did come through for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what about the countless people, uh, even, even specifically Christian martyrs, who did the same thing as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They stood up for God in the face of death, and they were burned to death. God didn't come through for them, and they were killed. What about them? It reminds me of the story of the, the first Christian martyr recorded in history. His name is Polycarp. I want to read you his story. Christianity Today, they... they um, recounted his story saying this, this man Polycarp, he lived from 69 AD to 156 AD. Okay, so this is just one generation where where after the apostles have, have died, they're passing on the faith to the next generation of believers. So this is early in, in the history of the church. It says that he came to faith at a young age and was arrested at age 86 by Roman officials. He was brought before a local proconsul who interrogated him in front of a crowd of curious onlookers. 
Now, Polycarp um, seemed unfazed by the interrogations. He carried on a witty dialogue with Quadratus until Quadratus lost his temper and threatened Polycarp. He'd be thrown to wild beasts. He'd be burned at the stake, and so on. Polycarp just told Quadratus that while the proconsul's fire lasts but a little while, the fires of judgment reserved for the ungodly, he slyly added, cannot be quenched. Polycarp concluded, but why do you delay? Come, do what you will. Soldiers grabbed him to nail him to a stake, but Polycarp stopped them. He said, leave me as I am, for he who grants me to endure the fire will, be able to, will enable me also to remain on the stake unmoved without the security that you desire from nails. And it says that he prayed aloud, the fire was lit, and his flesh was consumed, all while being nailed to the stake. But a chronicler of his martyrdom, martyrdom, he said this, that it was not as burning flesh, but as baking bread, or as gold or silver was refined in a fire. That's what they looked and observed. The account concluded by saying this, that Polycarp's death was remembered by everyone. He is even spoke of by the heathen in every place. Now, this is just one account of a Christian who gave their life, who was persecuted and died for their faith in Jesus. And it's reminiscent of what Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What what kind of attitude should we have when God does not come through to, for us in the way that we believe that he should? When we die, when we have, have loved ones that die from, from something that we've been praying for healing for? When we are going through something difficult, what we need to remember is this. Our hope is not in this earth, but our citizenship is in heaven. We're not promised an easy life on this earth, but we are promised, if you've trusted in Jesus, a life of an eternity spent with our Savior, where there is no death, there is no mourning, there is no crying, there is no pain, okay? And you've got to have that eternal perspective if you're going to see things the way that God sees them. That may not have been the advice that you may have wanted to receive today, but that is the advice that the Bible says. It's considerate joy when you're going through trials. God is teaching you and growing you through them. This was the hope of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This was the hope of every Christian martyr and should be our hope as well. Okay? As we go on, as we return to Daniel 3, I want you to keep on going to verses 24 and 25. We see that Nebuchadnezzar responds to their insolence and their rebellion being enraged again. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he had an anger problem. He should have been sent to anger management. But uh, we see because of his anger, he, in an enraged uh, <laughs> rant, he, he asks for the fires of the furnace to be stoked seven times hotter. Okay? Now, I don't know how they made the fire seven times hotter, but this furnace was probably something that was massively huge that uh, I don't even know what the purpose, is, purpose of it would be, but uh, it was obviously something that had these huge doors that people could be thrown into a hole, okay? It wasn't like those furnaces you would have seen from the Holocaust. This was something gigantic, okay? And it says that he orders that strong soldiers bind their hands Okay, so their hands are bound. They're being led to the furnace by these soldiers and says as, as, the, as the soldiers led them to this furnace to throw them in, that the soldiers actually died because of the immense heat that this furnace was putting off as the doors were opened. So these soldiers fall in dead. These boys, these three boys are thrown seemingly to their death in this fiery furnace. And that's where we see verse 24. Read it with me. Okay, verse 24 keeps on going to say this. The king Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste, and he declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered him and said to the king, true, O king. Obviously, this was a common occurrence because he didn't even know how many <laughs> there were. He was like, did we throw three? I thought we threw three. Okay, but guess what? Verse 25, he answered and said, 
But I see four men, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Take the beginning. He says, we threw three men bound, and now I see four men unbound and walking around. Okay, scripture says they were unharmed, they were unburned, okay? But there's actually something I believe did burn in this fire. What happened to their ropes? What happened to their bonds? That was keeping them tied up? It says that they were unbound. And I, I think this is something that you need to hear today, okay? Because it's this, the Bible says they were unbound, the ropes that were binding them were burned off by fire. Why is this relevant? Because the fire that you're facing right now, maybe it's, maybe it's for you, it's, it's a big fire, maybe it's a small fire, but you're begging God to deliver you from some kind of suffering. You're begging God to end this season of challenge in your life, to end this season of hurt, end this season of trial. You feel bound by it. But could I just propose that even as we just saw in this story, the very thing that you are asking God to remove from you is the very mechanism God wants to use to set you free. The very thing you want God to remove from you is the very mechanism God wants to use to set you free and then to set others free. And I'll tell you where I get this. James 1, James chapter 1. It says this, count it all joy. My brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When you go through the fire, remember, God has a purpose for it, just as James laid out for you, okay? But if you keep on going, if you read what, what 1 Corinthians says, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. It says, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Think about that. When you're going through something, when you're going through the fire, remember, God has a purpose for it. Even if it's just to refine your own faith, what we know is this, God will also use your experiences for you to help others who are going through the fire as well so that you can strengthen their hand in God, so that you can encourage and comfort those that are going through the same thing. Now, I've seen you guys do that to one another, and I want to encourage you when you're going through something difficult, have that attitude about it. God, you have a purpose for it. And even if it's just for the refining of my own faith or so that I, <laughs> so that I can help someone in the future with my marriage problem or my financial problem, you know, or my health problem, God, I want to just joyfully go through this. I trust that you are in control. The last thing I want to remind you of is this. And, and if, if, if this helps, I, I've been greatly impacted by this this week. It's, it's what, what's said here. Times of great suffering are also times of great fellowship with Jesus. Times of great suffering are also times of great fellowship with Jesus. Now you'll see Nebuchadnezzar, he responded and he said, I don't see three men, I see four men in the fire. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Now, to be honest, we don't actually know who this is. Okay? But I'll tell you who I think it is. Okay, he said this looks like the son of the gods. Okay, who is the son of the gods? Or who is the son of God? It'd be our savior, Jesus Christ. And that's, that's one interpretation of this passage. And, and you know, we, we see in the Old Testament that there were appearances of Christ before he actually came as a baby born to this earth and lived and died for us. It's called a Christophany, okay? And it, it, it's, it's happened. You can, you can see it happen throughout the Old Testament, okay? And that's what I believe that Daniel, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were seen in the fire. They were experiencing fellowship with none other than our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why I say, in times of great suffering... It's also a time of great fellowship with Jesus. 
What you need to know is this, and whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with today, whatever you're suffering through, God will show you his power and his presence in all kinds of different ways. But there will be a closeness, a tangible reality of his presence best when you're in the fire. When you're in the fire. Are you pursuing that? Are you pressing in on him? Because obviously when, when you're out of control, when you don't have control, what does it cause you to do? It causes you to pray. It causes you to reach out to him. I'd say, don't, don't stop. Keep on seeking him. Times of great suffering are also times of great fellowship with Jesus. How do, how do we conclude today? We see at the end of this passage that Nebuchadnezzar turns around again, just, just like we saw him do in, in the time, in, in chapter one with Daniel. Again, he turns around and he, he expresses this prayer of thanks to God. He says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command. And yielded up their own bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. You know what this tells me is this. Nebuchadnezzar saw their great faith. He saw that God was sovereign and supreme over the gods that he thought existed, over himself. And that is what I believe our community will see when we are those that demonstrate great faith when we are tested by fire.